I'm going to talk about research I've conducted on a variety of different insect species. I'm going to start with bees and work my way into lady beetles. I'm going to skip over the fruit fly work that I did, um, but it does exist somewhere in there. There will be a fruit fly on the slide at one point. Um, and when I say I'm going to talk about bees, everyone will think honeybee. Mm -hmm. And although honeybees are very interesting and they're very important, I'm here to be the advocate for the other 20,000 or so bee <laughs> species, some of which are just absolutely beautiful. Some that have unique biology, they nest in twigs, they nest in cavities of buildings, some nest in snail shells. They collect all sorts of pollen, some specializing to different plants. But what I cared about during my PhD was what influences different individuals to behave more like a queen and those to behave more like a worker. I got to work on during my PhD was a sweat bee. They are absolutely tiny bees that nest in the gardens, um, specifically around the university where I went to at Brock University. So I didn't have a very exotic field site, but they nest in gardens um, at your homes. As long as you aren't covering up that bare soil with mulch, you have access to bees and pollinators that way. And these sweat bees are particularly interesting for understanding social behavior and how individuals respond to their social environment, specifically stress imposed by other members. This bee is named Lazy Blossom Levissimum. It's a member of a lot of very similar looking bee species um, to the point where a lot of bee taxonomists bred this particular mm -hmm. genus. I love it. Mind you, I can't identify them. Um, quite readily, it's very strange for a focal species of your PhD to be difficult to identify. But nonetheless, they're interesting, and they're interesting because of their life cycle. So like other species of bee that do form social groups, which is relatively rare, these ones have queens, one female who starts the colony in spring. She lays eggs and she collects pollen for those eggs so that when they hatch, those individuals eat that pollen, and then they become her workers. So we have a really small nest, about two workers, one queen. She'll then stay in the nest, and she'll lay more eggs through the summer while the workers collect pollen. But what makes this interesting is unlike that honeybee picture I showed you, where the queen is massive and the workers are relatively small, and they're actually different morphologically, the queens and workers for this bee are both capable of behaving like a queen or a worker. So every female is just as able to lay as many eggs as the other few. This is very different from queens and workers and honeybees. But what makes this really interesting is few workers lay eggs in general, some of which do, and we don't exactly know what factors are contributing to that in every case and what, different, what stressors might be imposed on those workers to influence that behavior. And just to like really drive home this point, this is, these are histograms of queen size, of the number of queens on the y-axis, and then their size or binning of size in terms of their head width. These are very small bees. And we see a huge overlap in the head width size of queens and the head width size of workers, head width being a pretty good proxy for overall body size. It's also the interacting point of bees inside a uh, tunnel inside a nest. We have the mean indicated by the uh, little triangle here inverted. And you can see there's just a little bit of difference. So in general, workers and queens are relatively the same size. Inside the nest, the queen generally produces workers who are just a little bit smaller than her. Where and the, where are the males? Where are the males? They don't show up until the end of the year. So in that second batch of offspring that the workers collect pollen for and the queen lays eggs, then she finally produces males. Mm -hmm. So they're just almost secondary to the entire colony cycle. And in terms of the interacting individuals, they don't even stay in the nest overnight. They sometimes sleep on flowers in late summer. So even though we have workers and queens that are relatively the same size, I wanted to explore why these workers were opting to not lay eggs. If they can, you know, perhaps combat the queen. And the current kind of most 
accepted hypothesis in this situation is that the social environment is what keeps workers down. Now I sound like I'm in a union talk, but <clears throat> queen manipulation, specifically physical stress or her bullying her workers is what might lead to this reproductive depression for these workers. So this is a great image of a one bee putting another bee in a choke slam. This is her head with her mandibles across uh, the connection point between the thorax and the head here of another bee. So this bullying might be what's causing these workers not to lay eggs. Which means that we can make up a pretty easy prediction if this is our hypothesis. And that is queenless workers, workers that don't have a queen in their nest, mm -hmm. should be basically developing eggs in their ovary and ready to lay eggs the minute she's gone. Whereas workers who have queens in their colony, queen right workers, I'm borrowing language from honeybee biologists here, um, they should still be suppressing that reproductive or that ovarian development. So in the garden at Brock University, I watched bees for three, four summers straight, sitting out in a garden, drinking ice caps. Um, <laughs> I can't claim I'm a rugged field biologist. Um, painting bees, watching them in their nest. This is digging up or excavating a nest. Um, you blow baby powder down the tunnel and then you excavate and you track your way down and this works its way all the way to a pollen ball where workers have basically assembled pollen and then laid an egg. That's what the little white spot is on top. And then that hole keeps going down. So you keep digging and you collect all the individuals. You do this early in the morning so no one is left. And then you take these minuscule bees and then you dissect them and you're able to score the amount of ovarian development they have by counting how many fully developed eggs they are holding in their abdomens. They take up a huge amount of space per egg. So this is very different from other species of insects that have lots of eggs at one time. There's a lot of investment that goes into producing these eggs of this size. Mm -hmm. On that middle picture, you have very well-developed ovaries with an egg that's about to be laid probably in the next day or so. On the right, those are very spindly little ovaries. There's no egg or developing oocyte, likely from a worker. So I dig up these nests and then I classify individuals as queens or workers based on the time of year when I saw them, whether or not they're painted in spring, that's a good indication they'll be a queen, and the amount of wear that they've accumulated on their bodies, on their mandibles, or on their wings tells you a little bit about their age. And then I can score their ovaries. And this figure is a little bit similar to that size figure, so another histogram. We've got the number of individuals that fit into each one of these bins. And we've got their ovarian development score. So simply summing the fractional size of a fully developed or half developed or quarter developed egg. What you see is queens are very eggy, having one or two eggs in their abdomen. And workers, regardless of whether or not there is a queen in their nest or there isn't a queen in the nest. So simply by digging up the nest and then identifying whether or not the queen had survived to that point allowed me to end it basically use a natural experiment to compare queenless workers to queen right workers. And we see a little bit of a difference in ovarian development score between queenless workers and queen right workers, but you don't see an overabundance of workers developing their ovaries. In fact, what's really interesting about this is you actually see just a rough percentage of workers that are still developing their ovaries to lay eggs, right? So the queen control doesn't seem to be complete, but it also seems to be like it's lasting in these queenless workers. That if the queen's removed, these workers are still behaving like workers. They're not overdeveloping eggs. So the original hypothesis was that sweepy queens are manipulating worker behavior through continuous aggression. And that prediction was that those queenless workers would have lower or would have higher ovarian development than queen right workers. And that was just not true. And that's fine. This was a fantastic thing to have come out the other direction. Because what it showed was that even though that prediction was incorrect, it showed that maybe the queen's influence happens early enough in the colony cycle that once you remove her, that stress that was imparted on those workers is long lasting. Mm -hmm. So the damage has been done. Okay. What's 
interesting too is that a small proportion of workers developed their ovaries in both clean right and clean list workers, which seems to suggest that at least the queen might have an alternative strategy or a limited capacity to bully some workers. So if we think about it this way, if we have a queen and her workers, we've got green, they're behaving perfectly like workers, and we have blue, they're behaving perfectly like queens. If we remove the queen, the workers still behave like workers. That seems to be what we found relatively conclusively. But what's interesting is if we think about those other workers that are developing their eggs, the queen might have a limited capacity to control all the workers. And as you add workers to the colony, perhaps they start behaving more and more like queens until your colony reaches its maximum size. And now you actually have supplemental egg layers in the colony contributing to the entire family or group in this case, a relatively successful evolutionary strategy to make sure that the maximum amount of your genes might will be passed on. Very clever. It's kind of neat. That's why I fell in love with these. <laughs> um, and it kind of brings me to where there's a big transition in my story. So it's 2018. I grew a beard. I was about <laughs> to finish my PhD. I'd been married for about a year. We were expecting our first child. Life was really, really good. I was going to plan different postdocs or different next steps where I was going to work on exotic species and cool places. And then this article came out. And I was, my science brain was very rational, but this has to be an exaggeration. But the other parts of my brain were panicked that there would be no more insects for me to study. And that being some sort of biologist studying exotic species was just the worst path I could follow. This is to say the insect apocalypse is probably the most hyperbolic language that we could use to describe the current phenomenon. But it's not saying, it is addressing something that people do feel in terms of insect splatters on their windshields of their cars, not being to the same degree that they used to be. And although that New York Times article wasn't the most accurate or particularly helpful in terms of alerting the public that insects were in decline, it did alert us to the possibility that many populations and select ecosystems are in decline. So this meta-analysis is an excellent example of that. So we can see freshwater, terrestrial, and both environments. Those are your blue, brown, and gray bars in this case. And anything to the left of that dotted line are populations that are in decline. And anything to the right seems to be, there's evidence to suggest that those populations are actually increasing. Mm -hmm. And if we break this down, by our measurement in the top figure, by location in the middle one, and by different habitats in the bottom one, we can see that there are certain populations, particularly the terrestrial mm -hmm. habitats in North America when we measure them by abundance, that is total number. So there are some populations that are in decline, and it's important to understand which species are in decline and what is causing that decline. And to say that answer is very simple would be an understatement. There are a lot of human caused reasons for insect population decline. And this great review points to it and I love illustrations. So this spoke to me immediately, but what's really interesting and what kind of drove where my science went next was that about half of our climate or weather related reasons and the change that's going on. And although rising temperatures are not necessarily the main driver of insect decline, they certainly are a major factor that impacts the life cycles and the geographic ranges of different species. So instead of studying stresses caused by some obscure species queen on some workers, I decided to take a major stressor like temperature and try to see how that impacts uh, different traits of different insects. So this is our basic ectotherm physiology or thermal physiology 101. This is called a thermal performance curve. Insects are ectotherms, that is kind of commonly cold-blooded. The temperature inside their body 
reflects their external temperature. And animals that are cold, cold blooded or these ectothermic animal, animals like insects are dependent on at least staying within some range of temperatures because their internal functions and the reactions and the functioning of their enzymes depend on temperature. And this means that bigger traits like locomotion, growth, or reproduction are also very temperature dependent. So if we plot how well an insect moves, how fast it grows, um, or how many eggs it lays on the y-axis, and we look at temperature increasing as we move down the y or the x-axis here, we can see that perhaps they move faster or they grow faster up until a specific temperature that it's optimized. But then as we move past that temperature and it gets too hot, we quickly decrease in our performance until we reach zero. This isn't necessarily death. The inverted insect sometimes looks like it implies death. But this just means that we have basically no locomotion or we are no longer growing. And we can see these thermal limits at the basically uh, the cold end or at the hot end, right? As our CT min, our critical thermal minimum, or our CT max, which is our critical thermal maximum. These two measurements are really helpful in trying to establish the temperature limits that insects can exist in. Because if you can't move, you can't uh, escape predators, you can't be a predator, you're very susceptible to all sorts of danger. So being able to at least move in some capacity is optimal. <laughs> and that's when I took my first postdoc at the University of Kentucky. It was a strange time. This was pandemic in Kentucky. But we still wore masks and we still social distance, which was a fantastic image. And what I was tasked with at Kentucky was trying to analyze a really large data set and collect data. That was really a, a grand plan. And it required coming up and modernizing some measurements of CT min and CT max of those upper and lower thermal limits. So what I did was I tried to automate myself out of the job. When we measure CT min, we put insects in a jacketed column. We pump fluid on the outside of that column. And we decrease the temperature of that fluid. And as those insects inside are perched and they reach their CT min, they're unable to hang on. And then they fall through the column past an infrared sensor, which then counts them and then records the temperature that they fell through. So I no longer needed to stand there and watch. We also figured out a way to measure heat tolerance by videotaping insects at high temperatures. So insects may lose their locomotion or their ability to move as temperatures increase, but at high stressful temperatures, they can only maintain locomotion for so long. So we can videotape them. This is my fruit fly slide. Um, we can videotape them at those high temperatures and we can record the time or how long it takes before they're no longer able to walk with coordinated movement. This is heat knockdown. There are several other thermal limit measurements we use, but these were the two main ones I worked in Kentucky, worked on in Kentucky. And whether or not, or the, let's say low temperature of your CT min, depends like any other animal or plant trait on both genotypic and environmental effects. So some individuals, depending on their genotype, might have worse CT min. So worse would mean at a higher temperature, they fall off that perch. Or better CT min, that is at a lower temperature, they're still able to hang on. And just the same way that our genotypes as humans influence our hair color and our eyes, I'm speaking about CT min in the same context. And just as with any other trait, the environment impacts how well animals perform. Individuals that were exposed to a warm environment before they were tested sometimes uh, respond poorly or have weaker cold tolerance, so they fall off that perch faster. And those that are in colder environments might have stronger cold tolerance. This is acclimation. This is a long-term response to an environment. And just like with any other trait, we can have genotype by environment interactions. That is individuals with different genotypes respond 
more or differently or more extreme to different environments? And these were the questions I tried to answer in Kentucky. I haven't finished that work, <laughs> um, but that's what I use those methods for. Um, and it brings me kind of to where I want to go in this talk, mostly for the rest of it, is exploring those environmental effects, similar to how the social environment of bullying worker bees means they don't lay any eggs. We are looking at environmental effects um, and rearing conditions and different stressors that we expose the star of the rest of the talk, lady beetles, to. But sort of what you were talking about in terms of temperature, you were still working with bees, were you? No, no. So I had switched to fruit flies. Oh, the fruit. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I went to a model that was in no risk of the insect apocalypse. <laughs> can't, we can't kill fruit flies. Um, so then I, I took my, my new methods and I went to the Czech Republic for the science, um, working with some fantastic people at the uh, Czech University of Life Sciences in Prague. And I asked this question using a model organism there, which is how do environmental factors influence insect temperature, tolerance, and other seemingly unrelated traits? So I didn't want to just focus on how the thermal environment impacted thermal traits. I wanted to look at other insect traits. So the first thing I did was I tried to describe the initial and lasting effects of heat exposure during development and then see how that impacted adult traits. And then the second project I did was to describe the effects of multiple stressors, whether that be an infection or high temperatures, and how that impacted other seemingly unrelated traits. So if we start here, this is where we get into the lady beetle work. So the model we use is the Asian lady beetle. And depending on the audience I'm talking to, this is a nuisance mm -hmm. or a savior if you have an aphid problem in your garden. Mm -hmm. The harlequin lady beetle or the Asian lady beetle is one of the most successful invasive species on the planet. I put an asterisk next to successful because if you have an advantage like being purposefully introduced repeatedly over decades, and then you take hold of a particular geographic region, it's hard to say you're a great colonizer, but they certainly have now maintained a pretty dominant role in their niche. They were released in the South in the 80s, 70s. And they actually, the USDA stopped releasing Asian lady beetles only in the 90s. They're looking at other lady beetle species to release using drones, hmm. comical. Um, but they are at least native species of lady beetles. These ones, uh, their home range or their original range is um, in Asia. And they're incredibly easy to keep in the lab. So that's why I was drawn to them because they have, uh, let's say natural environment implications. Um, it's hard sometimes to extrapolate the stress tolerance data I collect with fruit flies and how that measures outside. But in terms of a agricultural pest and savior, the lady beetle traits seem to have some more of an impact that way. And just like other insects that go through complete metamorphosis, Lady beetles move from eggs, they hatch, and they go through instar larval stages, growing. So if you see this little guy on the underside of your tomato plants or other um, garden plants, these are lady beetle larvae. I would not kill them. They are there because you have some other pest on your plant, and they are eating them and growing. Mm -hmm. They then pupate on the underside of leaves, usually. At this stage, they're immobile. So they are very susceptible to the environmental stress that may come, whether that be a heat rate wave or a drought, they can't escape. And then they eventually close into adults and lay hundreds of eggs after they mate, repeating the cycle and being either a pest when it comes to winter, when they seek warm places in the cracks and crevices of your home, they aren't there for long, they aren't setting up a nest they are simply trying to overwinter, which I'm not discounting anyone's displeasure with that. <laughs> um, but they aren't there to stay. Come spring, they will leave. So we use these lady beetles to expose them to different conditions during development. 
specifically when they were pupa. And we kept them in the lab in petri dishes, that's tens of larvae per petri dish, and then we separate them out, putting one or two because they will eat each other, regardless of how much food you have. Apparently, your sibling is more nutritious than you. And then they pupate, and we can take them out. Um, this is a very freshly closed or set of the closed individuals. Their wings, their electria are still very wet. And what we did was we exposed pupa to different conditions, whether that be a normal temperature, an elevated temperature, or a very hot condition. So we had parental pairs, we collected their eggs and let their larvae develop. And then when they pupated, we put them into one of three different conditions, 17 degrees Celsius, 26 degrees Celsius, or 35 degrees Celsius. This reflects kind of the temperature conditions in Prague around June, July. And then we moved them back into that kind of stable 25 degrees, sorry, 26 degrees Celsius condition as adults. And then we assayed different traits. That is, we measured how well they performed in different ways for one day old individuals. And then we did the same thing with seven day old individuals to see if we saw differences caused by those high or medium temperatures and whether or not those differences were still there seven days later. So the first measurement we did was chill coma recovery. So when we cool insects all the way down to where they reach their CT min and they lose their motor or the ability to move, it takes a while for them to recover. So if we chill them to negative four degrees Celsius for about two hours, that induces what's called chill coma. And then we measure how much time it takes before they're able to right themselves and try to escape me, who they are perceiving as a dangerous predator. So if we take this measurement on the y-axis, so this is, as we go up, this means it took them longer to recover. And on the x-axis, we have one day old individuals and we have seven day old individuals. And we can see that in those individuals that just came out of their pupa or just the close, those that were exposed to the colder temperature recovered faster than those that were exposed to the medium or high temperatures. But when we took the same measurements in seven day old individuals over here, that effect was lost, washed right out. And everyone almost returned to what the status quo is for recovery time. Rather remarkable. Which means that individuals that maybe pupate through a heat wave are more susceptible to a cold snap, but only for a very short period of time after they are close. We measure heat knockdown time in the same way. So as we go up, this is actually better performance. So this is individuals are able to last longer at this high stressful temperature. And then we have one day old individuals and seven day old individuals. We don't have quite as clean of a pattern, but it's still there. That individuals exposed to high temperatures are able to withstand a very stressful temperature for longer. And this effect starts to go away as they age, but you're still seeing a difference between the hottest ones and the mm -hmm. coldest ones at day seven. So at least heat tolerance and the effects of developmental acclimation to that high temperature at least is holding a little bit longer. I wish we had more data points, but in a year of work, this is all you can do. We also looked at different sets of individuals exposed to these temperatures and wanted to see um, if this affected egg production and how much, how reproductive they were. And individuals exposed to those high conditions during pupation laid fewer eggs over their lifetime compared to those exposed to either the cold temperature or the regular rearing temperature of 26 degrees Celsius. So what does this tell you when you start to combine the story together? Is that as temperatures rise, there's a better chance for heat exposure during the development of these lady beetles, which will improve their heat tolerance at least immediately after they close and reduce their cold tolerance, but just for a short time. It's also interesting to see that lady beetles 
exposed to extreme heat, had better heat tolerance, but had reduced reproduction, which suggests that they might be, as they're going through the pupal stage of their development, might be investing more in self-maintenance mechanisms to survive future stress, mm -hmm. rather than putting those resources into developing their ovaries for laying eggs, at least some sort of physiological trade-off with reproduction going on here. Uh, how do they overwinter? How do they overwinter? So they find your house <laughs> and they group together. Um, so they aren't particularly great at overwintering fully exposed to the elements. No. So they are finding leaf litter or crevices in trees, but the most successful strategy is finding someone's warm house who is not willing to take them out into the cold. <laughs> So they overwinter by finding warm places. And we are very good at providing those warm places. Yeah. They overwinter as adults as well, which we'll talk about here too. So the multiple stressors I want to talk about are infection or a parasite specifically to lady beetles. So invading species like the Asian lady beetle also bring invading pathogens unwillingly with them, although the path pathogens are just very happy to be with a host. And they bring these pathogens with them as they move. So those green kind of tags, those are your beetle hangers. This is our tally of fungal ectoparasites. So a fungus is growing on this lady beetle. And as far as we can tell, the fungus completes its entire life cycle on the surface of lady beetles. And it likely infects new hosts and new lady beetles during mating events and overwintering. And we know this basically because of the location of those beetle hangers coincide with mating events and then all over lady beetles after overwintering. But as far as we can tell, this infection is pretty well, pretty much a nuisance. Because we can't seem, or there's little e evidence to suggest that being highly infected reduces your reproduction or the amount of eggs you produce or your lifespan. There is some indication that with too many beetle hangers, as you age, your mobility decreases, but it's hard to tease apart age because you don't get a lot of beetle hangers at the same time. Yeah? So does that mean that the fungi are not penetrating the parasites over the resources? Yes, they are penetrating, but they don't seem to be using resources at a level that has an immediate impact from the fungus alone. So there is some evidence that being heavily infected decreases overwintering success, perhaps because of the resources that the fungus is taking, that the beetle needs to survive periods without eating. But in all honesty, we know very little about the thermal performance of the fungus on its own, or even the beetles with the fungus attached. And that's the second question I asked while I was in process. Yeah. So if they like, if those things are living on them, if they produce offspring, would the offspring also be affected? No. Oh. No. So it's not transferred transfer from beetle to egg. That fungus is existing entirely on, yeah. yeah. So this was one of the more exciting parts of being in Prague was the countryside and the glorious flower strips in the agricultural fields. And we used, again, I like being outside despite having not very exotic field locations um, to ask this question. So we ran into a problem while I was in Prague that is, Almost 50% of the beetles we collected from the field were infected with beetle hanger, so we decided to take advantage of this. And we collected beetles at different seasons, which obviously have different temperatures. And we asked, how do seasonal shifts in temperature impact the immune response and thermal tolerance of infected and uninfected lady beetles? So our two factors that we were after, we wanted to tease apart, were collection date, summer collection and an autumn collection, and their infection status. We looked at 
counting every single tally. That didn't seem to have an effect. So it was easier just to bin them into infected versus uninfected, but we did look at it quantitatively. And we looked at different metrics. I'm going to talk only about three, but we looked at immune cell counts for whether or not the immune system appeared to be activated by these fungus or these fun the fungi that were on them. Their thermal preference, we'll talk a little bit about this, but what temperature those beetles wanted to hang out in if they were infected or if they weren't, and then how well they responded to temperatures. We're going to show a series of graphs like this, where we have infected lady beetles as black and then, or sorry, un uninfected lady beetles as black, infected lady beetles as gray. We have collection seasons or collection dates in the summer and in the autumn. The first data I'm going to show you is for uh, our measurement of the immune system or immune cell counts in the sites. So we have the number or the concentration of hemocytes circulating through the bodies of these lady beetles. We have our uninfected and our infected individuals, and we have them sorted by season. And what we see is that lady beetles collected in the summer tend to have higher hemocyte counts than those collected in the autumn. The way to read these graphs is that this thick band is our median. And then we sort out our boxes with our degrees of freedom. And the whiskers are indicating kind of the threshold of our min and max, at least within our statistical probability. And what we see is that infected individuals and uninfected, uninfected individuals don't vary all that much statistically. So the infection doesn't seem to be triggering an immune response. This is just one measurement, but we don't seem to have any immune response. So the beetles don't seem to be responding to try to kick this fungus off of them, or at least kill uh, the body parts or the parts of the fungus that are extending into their own body. But that's not the only way insects can respond <coughs> to an infection. So they aren't like you or I, that if we get sick, we get a fever. The reason is they don't control their own body temperature, but they can move their body into different locations to increase their body temperature to maybe fight off an infection. Or they can move to a colder environment to slow an infection. This is called behavioral fever. So we can put them on a thermal gradient that has a cold side and a hot side. And I can track their movement over a period of time and see where they like to hang out. That's what each of these dots are. And we can see whether or not they have a thermal preference relating to when we caught them or whether or not they're infected. And we end up with the same story as we did with the immune system. That is, where they decided to hang out was influenced more by season. So those caught in summer were likely to hang out in warmer areas of that gradient than those caught in autumn. But whether or not they were infected didn't have any effect on where they wanted to hang out on that gradient. So we built that gradient <laughs> just to find this out. <laughs> we also looked at those thermal tolerance measurements. So this is heat knockdown time again. So the higher up on the y-axis we are, the better able they're, uh, the better they are at it withstanding high temperature stress. We see the effect of season again with those exposed to warm temperatures during summer, having stronger heat tolerance than those collected in autumn, which presumably exposed to colder temperatures, but no effect of infection again, which we thought this would be two stressors. So certainly we'd see an effect at this point, which is what we ended up getting with cold tolerance. So at the other end of the temperature stress spectrum, we did finally see an effect of infection. So we have CT min, lower values on this axis, mean stronger cold tolerance. They're able to withstand colder temperatures better. Lady beetles collected in autumn had stronger cold tolerance than those collected in summer. So those that were exposed likely to colder temperatures. But then we see uninfected lady beetles having stronger cold tolerance than infected lady beetles. If there was going to be one variable that showed some effect of infection, this was the one that it should be, just because of previous information about overwintering success. So although lady be the lady beetle immune system doesn't seem to be responding to infection, but it does vary by season, infection had no impact 
on the variables we measured, which really demonstrates this is just a nuisance infection. But we did see that lady beetles that were infected had weaker cold tolerance than uninfected lady beetles, which might be related to that overwintering uh, result we saw where infected lady beetles had higher overwintering mortality. And one hypothesis to justify this is pulling from the hypothesis from that overwintering story, which is that the fungus might be draining certain resources that are important for withstanding cold temperature stress. The reason this gets a little bit muddy is because it's not entirely clear how fat stores impact really short punctuated cold tolerance. It's more obvious why having a lot of available lipids is important for withstanding prolonged cold exposure, but it's not exactly clear why having a lot of lipids will help you withstand cold on the matter on basically a time frame of an hour. It's the same as you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so this is kind of where that story is at this point. And this is the story I collected until I got to the mount. So now that I'm <laughs> at the mount, um, working with some talented undergraduate students who have brilliant ideas on how to get lab photos. <laughs> um, these are our bug shots with antennae of the species we work on. Um, me and then Sam who's my current honors thesis student, and Emma, who worked with me during the summer, kind of tackling any little science research project I wanted to, to try to build out the program I want to establish at the mount. Sam's working on lady beetles. He's continuing some of the work I did in frog. So we have a very healthy Asian lady beetle colony at the mount right now, all in these petri dishes. He's looking specifically at how diet and different diets that have different concentrations of lipids and proteins and carbs impact temperature and acute thermal stress. We've got diets that are commercially available because there's a big, relatively, there is a small garden industry that's keen on trying to help gardeners get lady beetles into their garden. Yeah. So there's a lot of commercial products to feed ladybugs. Yes? Are these the invasive Yes. Lady yes. Do we have any native ones? We do. We do. And the tricky bit is in they're in lower abundance, so they're harder to find. But this was our first step this last summer to bring something into the lab that we could work on. And next summer, we're going to bring in some native species. Because as a garden, should I be trying to encourage the native one, or does it not really matter? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going to matter too much in terms of your garden. Um, the diet you place, out or the way you encourage them to arrive, it's going to encourage native species at the same rate as, you encouraging, as you're encouraging invasive species. Mm -hmm. But you're going to see more invasive species because they appear to be out competing native species. Mm -hmm. So you'll see a lot of Asian lady beetles. You'll see a lot of seven spot, um, which are easy to identify because you can count their spots. <laughs> but you won't see the native ones as often. Mm -hmm. This is what Sam's doing right now. Emma took a really interesting project I had. So I wanted to get back to my bee roots and a particular species of twig nesting bee, Serotina, is found across the country, different species within this genus. And we knew that the avid naturalists on iNaturalist were posting mm -hmm. photos and location data around the HRM of different sightings of this bee. So Emma and I spent the summer traveling around the HRM looking for nests. We were successful, although we didn't find them in places we thought we would. <laughs> this bee is adorable. It nests in hollowed out pithy centers of twigs. In Ontario, it's raspberry. Around here, it seems to be more sumac and more blackberry. And they form their nest inside the pithy center, laying eggs on pollen balls, and these are developing pupa. So you're able to go out, open up the nest, collect the mother, and then actually develop those individual offspring. And we were able to set up fake nests, or at least decoy nests, to try to bring them into different thermal environments. So at the mount, there's a community garden, and I had the most drab plot <laughs> in the community garden of just dead sticks. <laughs> but I was trying to attract bees to nest in these sticks. 
we also went out and we collected bees in their nests in the morning, sealed them up and then moved them <laughs> to the garden. So they were relocated, they didn't care. They brought their nests and I brought them to a healthy garden with lots of flowers. But we were able to track their colony cycle, moving from pupa to eventual adult, adult offspring. And now we have a good model for bringing those nests back to the garden for this summer and then kind of exposing them to different levels of shade to give them different temperature experiences, see how many offspring they produce and how well they're able to uh, withstand acute thermal stress. So that's what I've done and what I'm planning to do. I have a lot of organizations that I'd like to thank for all this work and the students that are currently doing it. Um, and thank you guys for listening and the questions that happened uh, while I was talking. That was lovely, actually. Um, so thank you. Thank you.